Hey, welcome back to The Health Bridge. Dr. Pedram here talking about how to get the right stuff in front of our children. Anyone with kids knows how hard it is to get them to eat fruits and vegetables, particularly with all the advertising out there with less nutritional choices. My guest today is part of a team that's done some really interesting work about this, Dr. Drew Hanks. He's an assistant professor of consumer sciences at Ohio State University, uh, and he's a behavioral economist who's primarily primary interests are consumer food choice and eating and the economic and psychological factors that influence these decisions. Uh, Dr. Drew's research has led him to conduct studies at restaurants, grocery stores, and homes, and he's published numerous articles on behavioral economics of food choice. His most recent study is in school lunchrooms. To see how marketing might affect the consumption of vegetables in grade school cafeterias, this is fascinating stuff. Doc, welcome to the Health Bridge. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for doing the work that you do. This is important. I got two young kids and uh, man, there is a barrage of advertising that comes at these guys. And so you guys decided to take a look at how to flip this thing on itself and use some of the tactics that the, the food industry has been using to actually market vegetables. I mean, what a novel idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I, you'd think, well, why, why hasn't anyone tried this before? And, and I think what happens is these sorts of things do do happen, but a lot of the attention is paid or focused on maybe what's the advertising for more of the sugary things. But really, what we wanted to do is take, you know, uh, take these tactics and employ, employ them in the school lunchroom, where a lot of times attention is more focused on okay, how are we going to get rid of certain things or maybe they're eating too much of one thing as opposed to what can we do to motivate these healthier choices. Huh, that's interesting. So when you say get rid of some certain thing, are you talking about just like oversupply, like hey, we got, we got too much you know, uh, fish sticks in this week, let's move them? <laughs> oh, more, more, so the, more so the sugary items or the snack foods, the, what they refer to as uh, competitive foods. There's been several regulations um, reducing, limiting the amount of these foods that can be offered and restricting the types that can be served in school lunchrooms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we want to make sure our kids are, are eating healthy and, and making good and proper choices. But my research is really focused on instead of, instead of restricting choice, why don't we try and encourage healthy options and, and see if that can really move kids towards making these healthier choices. It's like uh, Mother, Mother Teresa used to say, um, I won't go to an anti-war rally, but I will go to a pro-peace one. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. It's, it, it's, 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 a, you know, it's really a frame of mind and, and thinking about, okay, you know, if we restrict choice, sure, they're not going to eat it, but are we really teaching? What are we really teaching them? Um, are we, is, once the options are there, is it really being beneficial to them because how they learn to make the healthier choice. And so with this particular study and other research I do, it's, well, if we can arrange an environment to encourage a healthier choice, maybe we can help, um, maybe help them make those decisions um, even with the other stuff there. So I want to get into what you did here because sure. marketing vegetables um, you know, every parent tries it, everyone tries to make broccoli cool. How did you guys actually get successful at this and what, what made it work? Sure. The, we, we collaborated with Super Sprouts, which is a, a private company. They had developed these, these uh, vegetable characters on their own. And so we had nothing to do with uh, how these Super Sprouts characters were developed. And so they had, the founders of Super Sprouts had, created this set of characters, you know, uh, eggplant, tomato, zucchini, broccoli, carrots, uh, peas, uh, mushrooms, onions, garlic. They, they, you know, created this story around how these vegetables came to life and developed these superpowers. And they had already started going across the country doing uh, different shows for kids. And, but they wanted some hard evidence demonstrating that, hey, this can really have an impact on, on what kids are choosing. Um, and so my group had already been doing research for a while in school lunchrooms, so they said, why don't we team up and see, and see what we can do in a, in a school lunch setting? 
And so we teamed up with them, and we uh, they have these uh, vinyl banners that you can wrap around the base of a salad bar. And so if you imagine a salad bar with the different trays up top, the different components, and then right below that area is the the base area and they wrap this banner around it that has all these vegetable characters you know um, you know in different poses and so it's at its marketing in that way and they also have these clips that you can access on supersprouts.com a lot of times they're talking about nutritional messages or different recipes um, but just different clips of these vegetable characters that were looping um, looping on these uh, uh, flat screen televisions that we placed in the school lunchrooms and so our yeah our, and you know to make it a a proper experimental design for research purposes we had some schools uh, do just the vinyl banners some schools do just the television screens and then some schools did both well we had another set of schools that didn't have anything in place and oh go ahead uh, it's just I was looking at some of the statistics, and it's it's actually uh, amazing what I'm seeing. First of all, this is right. an amazing venture between so, sort of like a pro uh, profit, like for profit entity that's out there making innovations, and then an educational institution which says, "Hey, this is interesting. Let's study it." Um, which is you know, it's it's nice that the impetus is coming, and, and there's collaboration there. But let me let me read some of these results, um, and we could uh, get into it. Is ninety point five percent uh, more students took vegetables from the salad bar when exposed to the vinyl banner only. 239.2% mm -hmm. when they uh, did the salad bar exposed to the television and the vinyl banners. And then, um, yeah, so I mean, that, that, that's the big one. Uh, so the, the combination right. is amazing. And the TV only one I don't have in front of me, but that's, you know, that, that is a lot of variance and change from, you know, behavior yes. that was just kind of out there and we just thought it was automated, they just don't like vegetables. <laughs> That's right. Well, what is amazing is we just think about a simple change in the lunchroom and we can move kids to taking more vegetables, tripling the percentage of kids actually going to the salad bar to take vegetables. And what we think is going on here is, you know, we're drawing their attention to the salad bar and exciting their imagination with these vegetable characters you know kids kids like superheroes they like these sorts of things and and we find here that hey look if we're able to you know promote vegetables using these sorts of things that kids really enjoy we can really see a big impact and speaking to your point about um you know this vinyl banner we find an increase in these vinyl banner and television combination had the biggest impact Interestingly, the televisions by its themselves didn't have an impact. Um, and we think what's going on is the vinyl banners were really at the point of selection, right there where the kids were making the choices for vegetables. The television screens, on the other hand, were we tried to place them as close to the salad bar as possible, but you know, depending on space limitations or constraints or, you know, uh, accessible outlets to plug in the TVs, uh, it, it created some variation on actually where those TVs were placed. So what we conclude from that is right at the point of selection, if we're able to really uh, market the foods that we want the kids to take right where they're making the choices, that can really have an impact. I mean, just think about uh, the grocery store, right? What, what are the things placed right there, right as you're about to check out your groceries? Right? It's the same, same sort of idea, right at that point of selection. What can we do to encourage kids to take? And we find you know, this vinyl banner really, really made a big impact. You know, it's interesting is a lot of people in the health industry feel that marketing is so dark and the dark side has kind of exploited all this to kind of leverage the, the young brains uh, or the or the parental purchasing decisions to you know get us to kind of go in the wrong direction because they want it and so what you guys have done is taken a neutral stance used the same type of marketing to promote pro health messaging and uh, these numbers are staggering it's amazing yeah it, it really is and and 
you know, speaking to your point on, you know, there are a lot of advocate, or a lot of people saying, you know, let's get rid of marketing altogether to kids because of, as you said, you know, we see the marketing, it's focused, a lot of times we see it focused on, on unhealthy foods or, you know, sugary foods or snack foods that, that um, you know, maybe okay once in a while, but, you know, constant consumption of them is really not good. And our goal here was, well, if we can start, you know, changing a mindset and think about what can we do to market vegetables or what can we do to market these healthier items, right? Uh, what sort of change can we see? And, and there clearly is uh, a big impact here, right? And so now it's, okay, how do we team up with the right groups in order to make this happen? You know, and uh, the Produce Marketers Association actually teamed up with Sesame Street oh, several years ago, several years ago to, and a lot, and, and Sesame Street allowed their brand to be used in marketing vegetables for free. So, you know, anyone who wanted to use any one of those Sesame Street characters could do that. And so it's a similar, you know, would have been a similar sort of take if we saw something like, you know, Sesame Street in a, in a school lunchroom kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but so there are steps being made. People do realize the value uh, of it. And so hopefully this research is really going to keep pushing that forward. And and really moving it in a good direction. I mean, this might be dating me by saying this, but when I uh, when I was growing up, there was Popeye eating spinach, right? And, <laughs> and that right. was a, a pro, you know, vegetable stance. And I don't know. I mean, did uh -huh. anyone actually look at what Popeye did uh, for spinach and for for popular culture and driving kids to eat spinach? I, I don't know if anyone was researching that then. Yeah. So I've uh, I've tried to pull the stats on that actually, <laughs> and and. I don't have any hardcore statistics. Um, there, there are claims that it, it really helped the flailing spinach industry uh, around the the early 1930s, when you know when this when this came out, and there are claims it it really increased the amount of spinach people were consuming. As far as hard statistics, I don't I don't have those. I I've, I've looked for them but don't have them. Hmm. Um, but yeah, it's the same sort of idea, right? It's uh, I like to call that. Uh, a medical miracle, right? So Popeye is is here, maybe getting beat up by his enemy, and then what does he do? He whips out his can of spinach, peels the top off, and downs it, and all of a sudden he's much better, right? Ready to fight. Or, or he could just say that um, when he needs the extra strength, there's sometimes when he just downs it, right? And so um, that that sort of theme is actually used quite consistently in advertising, not only to kids but also to adults, right? Where you where you see some sort of situation where someone might need a, you know extra strength or whatever and they consume the food and voila right mm -hmm. they they have the strength and so it's a it's a common theme but um, yeah if, if something like that could be used for marketing food right uh, marketing healthy food right that that would be like just like spinach right um, we I'm sure we could see some some good impacts from that I would love to, and I'll get uh, the show producer here to get some of uh, the visuals on this, if we can get rights to it, mm -hmm. just to show some of the characters, because you got to make it contemporary, right? It's like if you show Popeye to kids right. now, forget about it, right? And so <laughs> right. What, are these, right. what are these characters, what kind of <clears throat> kind of neuroscience goes into this? I mean, everyone, you know, you hear these stories about McDonald's having neuroscientists and behavioral scientists uh, doing, mm -hmm. you know, functional brain scans and all sorts of stuff, trying to figure out what color and texture will spark a young young kid's brain. So are we mm -hmm. applying the same type of kung fu to these kind of good guy characters, if you will, to be able to kind of draw kids over? <laughs> uh, in this particular study, I don't think we we use that those that sort of a quote unquote trickery, if you will. Um, <laughs> but um, the the main the main target in this particular study was how how can we use these positive messages, and and that that definitely is an area of research where the way you the way you um, create a message, the way you would, what we call is framing it, right? How it's how it's portrayed, how it's given to students, and so if the message is get you know take salad at the salad bar, then if we deliver that message in a very enticing way to the kids, 
then yeah, that can have an impact. And man, you know, that's that's uh, that's been shown time and time again in research. And you know, maybe maybe there are some more developments that can be made using you know the research from these fMRI studies, or you know, or you know these other behavioral scientists. And I'm sure there's there are great insights that can be used. And I think, for all intents and purposes, leverage those to help motivate the healthy choices. Uh, you know, in school lunchrooms or wherever else it might be. Um, but this particular study was was pretty, pretty um, standard. You know, marketing how how we how we send the message to the kids. So there's a, a real interesting through line here, which is one. It's 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 really one of real estate, because if you know, I, I'd grab the iPad and I just you know, if I let my kid just kind of run with it. There's all sorts of crazy videos on YouTube of kids buying toys or you know getting toys gifted to them so they could you know entice other kids to get the toys and so there's a very competitive landscape for messaging to get in front of your kids however yes. when we talk about schools we're talking about the commons right we're talking about an uh -huh. area that's somewhat protected and we're supposed to kind of keep the marketing messaging out and so if we could put positive messaging there they're there mm -hmm. however many hours a day and they're going to mm -hmm. be exposed to messaging that would otherwise be kind of drowned out uh, by mm -hmm. advertising dollars spent by these kind of big sugar brands. So uh, I think, you know, the, the fact that the schools partnered with you on this and allowed for this mm -hmm. was really uh, a, a powerful way to get this out there because I don't, I don't know if you could compete. I mean, you would need so much money to compete on, say, YouTube or, or national television with the same kind of messaging. Sure. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and all the messages out there, right, like you say, it would be easy for these for this kind of message to get drowned out quite quickly just because there's a lot of noise and there's you know all sorts of messaging out there and that's one of the reasons um, I've done a lot of research in school lunchrooms is because of the environment and it's and it makes it a place it's fairly controlled where you can um, where you can do fairly clean studies like this interestingly um, some studies where you know they'll place posters of of celebrities maybe you know Making a healthy choice, eating a an apple or whatever on the walls in the in the actual lunchroom, but those seem to have limited success, and I and I think that's partly because it's not at the point of selection. We're, if we're if we're able to put it right at that point of selection where the kids are making the choice, at least in in, in school lunchrooms, and yeah, we could see an impact. Um, but going back to your point on all this, you know, kind of noise. And, and, and all the extra marketing, you know, as a parent, I have, I have four kids myself, and I think uh, there's, there's a great opportunity for parents or guardians of children to talk to them and help them become familiar with mm. the types of messages out there and, and help them understand, you know, okay, there's going to be a lot of stuff out there you're going to be exposed to, but if they are familiar maybe with these these advertising, you know, they're familiar with the vegetables or whatever healthy food is being is being marketed. There's a greater chance that they can relate to that, and and potentially uh, that might potentially um, change their behavior. Yeah, I, I mean, listening to this as a parent, uh, one thing that comes to mind is, hey, what the heck is happening at my kid's school? Type of thing. Like, why why aren't we doing these types of programs there? Which, as a parent, if, if you're listening to this, uh, these are questions that you should ask. Like, share this show, share this study, and say, hey, listen, there's some good stuff happening, uh, and so we would like to have the same kind of positive messaging in, in our school. And um, this this actually brings to light a conversation that's been kind of up front and center in my my brain. Uh, we're, our next movie is on conscious capitalism, and I just got back. I've been on the road. Uh, filming interviews with people that are really doing some powerful things and this one group uh, has put a lot of capital into bringing organic food to scale and really helping create access to organic food and one of the challenges is always messaging and it's just like if I'm a natural products brand if I'm an organic brand that's doing the right mm -hmm. thing uh, mm -hmm. this to me speaks to saying listen you need your own media department you need to partner with media you need to get cartoon people you need to work with organizations that understand this other advertising play to really start bringing your healthy brands to market in a way that's actually gonna you know get consumed by the kids that you're making it for. Right. right. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly right. Now, whether it's character, you know, these special characters or something else, um, I think 
the point that they find a way, you know, work with the right groups to leverage these insights mm-hmm. is, is, is key. And to be very strategic about who they're marketing to, what their target audience is, and then how they're going to be able to, or, or what are the findings from the science that will help them develop the right kind of message, right? Whether, whether it is, you know, these animated characters or something else, right? But, but using those insights is, is definitely key in, in sending the right message to encourage uh, the choice, these choices. Um, my, uh, my, in my show notes, I actually have um, a little blip that says spinach sales went up 33% during the Depression, which, uh, mm-hmm. you know, is, is uh, a powerful indicator that maybe Popeye did do something right. Right, right. And that's, that's one of the statistics. It's not easy to pinpoint right. Popeye, right? But um, the fact that he was there <laughs> right. during, that, during that time, the early 30s, is is suggestive. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and so, you know, what, what else was the spinach industry doing for itself then? And so we could kind of go back and extrapolate. <laughs> it's not, it's not on the nose, but it's interesting. Uh, right. it any, is. any difference sure. in gender, uh, age, uh, in terms of how this messaging landed? Yeah. So a slight difference. We, uh, we find that, that the, that females seem to be a little more responsive to both the TV and the banners. Whereas the the boys in the cafeterias, the males weren't uh, weren't as responsive to the TVs, but they were responsive to the banners, right? Oh. And so there's very slight uh, difference in, in in the response. Um, once again, I think that speaks to having you know that marketing for this particular study right at the point of selection. It seemed to work well for both boys and girls, um, but interestingly. You know, we, we consider this finding for boys quite encouraging because, you know, at baseline, you know, before anything is done, boys tend to select, select and eat vegetables less than girls do. And so finding a way to bump that up, you know, improve the nutrition of, of the boys in the schools can, you know, have some ramifications, not only as far as behavior goes, but performance in school. And so there definitely is uh, definitely something positive to consider there, yeah. um, seeing that impact. Now, these are vegetable characters, right? The actual yes. cartoons were vegetable characters. And have you played, sure. I, I know that there, you, know, you guys have suggested, you know, so you talked about Sesame Street, which has animal characters, and, you know, then Popeye was a guy. So has mm-hmm. anyone looked at the kind of the correlation here to see what's working better, or is that future research? That's future research, yeah. It's, uh, Great question. So I, it's uh, something I don't, not quite sure uh, how to answer that. But you make a great point. Is it, is it the human animation or is it animal character, a vegetable character come to life with superpowers? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I'm not quite sure exactly what the difference is. And yeah, it's definitely interesting to to consider. Were there the superpowers studies. implied with these vegetable characters in this? Um. Not necessarily, yeah. So the vinyl banner, it, for some of them, yes. For some of them, it was easy to show. For example, uh, the broccoli character has super strength, right? And so it's easy to show his big biceps on the vinyl banner, right? Or, uh, but for, um, for the carrot, uh, he has super good str- uh, vision, but that's not easy to show on a banner. So some of them you could see the super power and others you, know, you weren't able to. Interesting. Uh, And then any follow-up messaging outside? I mean, I'm assuming under the controls of your experiment, it was all just at point of decision, but did you also have the same characters kind of spread throughout kind of visual, uh, you know, areas of of the campus? No, it was focused primarily in the cafeteria, um, just in that space. You know, our goal was to understand, part of our goal was to separate our research from others because others have done something similar where they do a full, you know, full like school wide marketing where, you know, there's curriculum in the classroom that's used and, and there are other incentives for making, you know, healthy choices in school lunchroom. We wanted to focus our attention right on the school lunchroom, right there on the lunch line. If we do this marketing, is it going to work? Mm. And, you know, and not have everything else around to kind of potentially, um, uh, potentially hide what we were trying to get at in the school lunchroom. 
Great. So yeah, I mean, point of sale. I mean, and and oh. your your results speak for themselves. So you know, mm -hmm. you've actually uh, nailed it. Now it's just a model to keep proving out. I want so, some of this other stuff I'm looking at here is sure. uh, uh, the percentage of Black and Hispanic students in schools vary from 73 percent in control scru schools to 94 percent in schools with a vinyl banner. Who who? Yeah, where was this? What types of areas? Uh, it says it was large northeastern U.S. school district. Right, right. As in a, a school district, and we've agreed not to disclose this particular district, um, but it was a large urban area, and so there were it was quite mixed demographics in, in the district, and so and also in in our demographics, you can see a, a difference in you know percentage of kids receiving uh, free and reduced lunches, and so in other words, that would speak to you know, some of the income demographics in the district. And so there was there was some variation amongst the schools. But to see, right, this, um, to see this kind of change uh, in, in the schools, um, you know, if we wanted to figure out, like, cultural or ethnic differences, that had to be a whole nother, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, a whole nother study. Um, but, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't consider them, uh, different enough to really cause alarm and 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 just considering the jump this the sizable jumps we saw in, in the percentage of kids taking vegetables big and so and and so broccoli carrots spinach peas onions garlic zucchini tomatoes eggplant and mushrooms that's right it's good variance that's a good variant. <laughs> and, and so did you source these from the same kind of source that the cafeteria gets them? Um, you know, it just came through the supply chain and you just provided vegetables or did this company provide the vegetables? Yeah, we actually didn't provide, uh, we didn't change anything on the menu at all. Um, all we did was just use these, these um, the banner and the TV to market what was already being used, being sold in the school lunchroom. And so, you know, eggplant typically is not is not sold in school lunchrooms. Uh, and so I don't think we saw any, you know, anyone take more eggplant, for example. But just the fact that these things were marketed in some of the standard vegetables, like the broccoli and the carrots and the spinach and um, even mushrooms sometimes as well. And, you know, uh, you know, and peas also, you know, marketed directly to the kids. And so it wasn't, we didn't, we didn't try and, and, and make the vegetables sold on the line specific to what was marketed by these characters per se, but the, just the general idea of, of exciting kids about going to the salad bar, picking the vegetables there and, and, you know, just relying on what the school had already been doing. So. Uh, I'm assuming there's uh, a number of follow-up studies that are already kind of banging around in your brain trying to figure out where to go <laughs> from here. Uh, you know, one of which for me on the doctor side would be looking at their behavior, looking at their, you know, their, their test scores, looking at you know, how, yeah. how often they get into trouble. I mean, look, assume, uh, presumably if they're consuming more vegetables, they should start seeing some impact in other, in other kind of metrics, whether it be biometric mm -hmm. or psychological. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the hard things about, about that is, um, is sometimes those take a little more time to track. You know, I'm not, I'm not a nutritionist or, or a, you know, a medical doctor by any means, so I can't claim to know the exact science. But, you know, changing the you know, amount of vegetables a kid eats, you know, um, over a couple days or even several weeks you know, I think this would have to be more of a sustained change um, for us to really start seeing outcomes in terms of test scores. As far as behavior goes, however, you know, if we're able to provide the nutrients, um, you know, the calories and the, the correct nutrients, my, my initial hypothesis would be we can see some behavior change fairly quickly if kids are getting the, because, you know, they feel the, the effects from poor nutrition and, you know, not enough calories right away. And, I mean, anyone does. And so that would, that would definitely, I think, a behavior change would be visible really quickly. This is a six-week period that mm -hmm. we're looking at here with 90% on, you know, one with the banner only and almost 240% 240 almost 
uh, for the groups that had kind of the, the, the double dip. Uh, that's huge. And so are they continuing this program or was it just a pilot study and now the carts are out of there? <laughs> this was, yeah, this was a pilot study and the schools kept the materials and, and we weren't able to conduct any follow-up with them. And so if they are continuing or not, we don't know. But, you know, going back to your comment about, you know, future research, where we are, where are we going? One of the key questions is, is this a sustained behavior? Once the interventions are removed, you know, does behavior stay? You know, the kids still going to the, vet, the salad bars. And another question is, how long before the effects start to wear off? Right? What kind of novelty might, might be at play here? Not some sort of, you know, kids think, oh, this is so cool. But once they get used to it, you know, does it wear off over time? And so, you know, um, so this four-week study, we see huge impacts. And some research I'm currently doing is, is trying to get at, okay, uh, how long before we might start seeing a dip? Or is there going to be a dip at all? Is this, is this enough to keep kids excited the whole semester? I would, so. as a media guy, I would hypothesize that unless you dripped new narrative and new character mm -hmm. arcs and, and kind of refreshed the content, they would stop seeing it. Right, which is how cartoons work and how a lot of this stuff works, right? Which means, right. you know, someone's paying for that. <laughs> sure. Yeah, but, yep. but you know, we, we don't know until we know. Um, but what we do know is this initial experiment was incredibly successful and uh, Absolutely. You know, it's heartwarming. I mean, it's re it's, this is great news. Yeah, oh, exactly. And, and you know, I think, I think that's, that's where future research can be so valuable in, in helping expose, you know, where, where do we need to refresh or what might be the right way to, to try and change the message just a little bit to maintain that sort of uh, change in the school lunchrooms. I love it. If I fire with fire, use, you know, use media and messaging to bring the good stuff back into our, our schools and our cafeterias. This is, this is right. powerful stuff. So, so where, are you, where are you headed from here? What's the next, uh, what's the next series of experiments? Yeah, so I actually just wrapped up some experiments in the spring looking at, okay, one set of experiments we're looking at, at what point do we actually see a dip in, in the effectiveness of a, an intervention in schools? So it wasn't quite the same marketing. It was a little bit different, but the idea was the same as, you know, what point do we maybe need to refresh, right? And, and and the second one was looking at when we have an intervention in for five weeks, you know, uh, and if we remove that intervention, does do kids still can behave in the same way? Do they still continue to take those vegetables, for example? Mm -hmm. And so I'm I'm just doing the analysis. The results are pretty still fairly preliminary, um, but I will I will say that it does seem like about halfway through the semester is when you need to consider uh, refreshing the intervention. And then um, there is some sustained change, I find, after five weeks when, you're, when you remove um, the intervention, but it's, it's fairly limited. So it makes sense, right? Something in place for five weeks, I wouldn't expect it to have change behavior on a longer term basis. So that makes sense to me. Um, but there is, there is some you know, in some ways, I do see a little bit of a, a, a continuation of the behavior after, you know, after the intervention is removed. But, these, you know, these are important questions, and, you know, especially in, in school lunchrooms where kids aren't only, you know, going to school for a whole semester and then have a break, but then they're changing grades and they're going on to middle school or going on to high school where the whole environment's different. And then where we got to think about, okay, what can be done in these areas, you know, in these settings to help maintain any sort of change that we initially saw. I mean, to me, logically, it seems like, you know, the, the amount of inundation that they'd be getting from, you know, any sort of off-site messaging and just the mm -hmm. stimulation and everything's so new, everything's just constantly coming at their adapting brains. So unless you kind of refresh the messaging, um, you know, eventually mm -hmm. there'll be a diminishing returns. But oh, I, th this, mm -hmm. is, this is 
fascinating. I think I think it's it's really heading in the right direction. Um, I think this is a hallmark study, and I, and I really think that you guys are um, going to change the nature of the game. Like the entire game will change as as kind of pro health uh, organizations really get you know uh, attuned with this and start changing around what we're doing. I don't know. Maybe it's time to strike a, a partnership with Pokemon, man. <laughs> <laughs> Pokemon Go seems to be having a big impact on exercise, at least, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, so, I'm, you know, I'm waiting for the kids uh, to get hit by cars by accident. You know, it's just there's so oh, many okay. other social fallouts yeah. that we haven't even looked at with that. But we know that it is attracting the minds of young young people all the way. I mean, there's you know millennials all into it. So, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think I think there are a lot of opportunities out there, and and getting in touch with the right people, and connecting the right the right groups of people is is key, and getting you know, there's a lot of a uh, lot of movements. You spoke, you mentioned this early on on a new uh, movie you're coming out with, where corporations, you know. There, there's a social movement, and so there's this kind of social responsibility feeling amongst uh, a lot of corporations, uh, especially newer ones, where they want to have a social impact and not just make profits, right? They want to make sure they're doing good. And so I think, you know, this research coupled with, you know, the marketing insights we can gather, coupled with this movement for social responsibility can really make a big impact, um, you know, in, in you know my research, for example, with what people are choosing for uh, to eat, but also you know what people are choosing for their exercise, for their you know, and you can even go into financial realm like saving, making sure people are saving for retirement, and make you know just making good decisions for you know for their future selves, basically. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing how much interference there is. There's so many media messages trying to drive you into different directions. And you know, the good guys never really thought about this, right? And if you want to bring pro-health messaging, you really have to look at what's working. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you know, you said it best at, at first is, you know, uh, working on keeping the junk food out is one approach. But inspiring the healthy food, that's a whole other paradigm. And this is really going to crack that open. And, and I, th I think it's a very refreshing way to look at how to bring this back into our schools. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, some of the other research I do is, is looking at something similar, not, not quite marketing in the sense of using these characters, but, you know, what can we do to make the healthy food more attractive or or make it more appealing, or just make it more salient to the person making the food selection, right? Mm -hmm. And so just, just how an environment is arranged, whether it's through messaging, whether it's through visual cues, whether it's through, um, you know, any, any sort of situational cue, what can be done to influence what people are choosing? So a lot of, there are a lot of things that can be done, and this is just one of the many yep. opportunities that and you know that that companies can can try to increase you know to encourage healthier choices. Yeah, it's a great case study, and the numbers the numbers are astonishing. They're really they're really positive. Yeah. And we have a lot of you know we've done a lot of stories with guys and you know like local farmers that are having very good success uh, getting uh, local ag like gardens or, or local farms for mm -hmm. kids at schools, and then because they've touched the, the earth and they've been involved, they're much more likely to consume. Sure. Uh, and, and this is uh -huh. coming from a completely different uh, angle, which is using media messaging. So you take all this together and you really have a promise of a, of a better, healthier world. And you know, yeah. uh, you, got, you got four kids, I got a couple kids, we're doing this for them, man. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, my kids love, they love our garden. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and, and they love going to pick the, the lettuce and the spinach and you know, the peas and green beans, everything we've got growing out there. And you know that's exactly right. We're doing that to help them develop those ha healthy habits, get them excited and exposed to these different foods that are good for them. And uh, yeah, I think it's for them. What what can we do to make that next generation a little bit better than this one? 
so Doc, I, I'm a big fan of your work. I'm going to be following you. I think that this is really uh, innovative and I think it's uh, going to be moving the conversation forward as it already has. Uh, we'll put a, you get a long website URL, so we'll put a link uh, in the blog right. on well.org. So if you're listening to this, it's long. Just go to, go to well.org blog, you'll find the story and we'll have a link there. And I'll uh, put up a copy of this study that we've been talking about here as well because again, this is, this is really good stuff and it's good news for the good guys. That's right. That's exactly right. And then, you know, uh, a group where that also does a lot of similar research is the Food and Brand Lab at Cornell University. So foodandbrandlab.org is another great place to check out. Fantastic. Fantastic. Hey, thanks for doing what you do. This is, this is wonderful. It's encouraging. And um, I'm going to keep following your work because uh, I'm a fan. Right. Great. Thanks. No, I appreciate that. I, it's always great to see that the research you do is making an impact. Yep. And, and, and there's been all this talk about how things in the ivory towers never get down to, to Main Street, okay. but nothing gets more Main Street than a school cafeteria. That hits us all really close to home. And so, you See know, that. thanks for taking yep. care of our kids. Doing my best. <laughs> yep. Thanks for your interest in the research. Yep.